A very good morning to you all. Welcome to the second part of our series and conversations under the Amcham Business as a Force for Good initiative. Today we focus on sustainability in healthcare. My name is Marcelo Kello. I'm the Chief Executive of the American Chamber of Commerce, Kenya. And I really want to thank you for joining us uh, this morning. So some quick pointers before we begin. Our forum this morning will run for one and a half hours. Um, <clears throat> we have two segments. The first segment, um, you'll get to hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Beatrice Gatumia, um, who's the business lead at AMREF Medical Center, as well as Eric Angula, Head of Strategy and Partnerships, Global Health Africa at Medtronic Labs, and from Umra Omar, Founder and Executive Director at Af Safari Doctors Initiative. The second segment will feature a panel discussion and a Q&A, which will be moderated by Rebecca, a partner at Hudson and Sander. Remember, as you move along to submit your questions um, in the chat tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, as the session progresses. We also, at an appropriate time during Q&A, may call on some of you to field your questions directly to the panelists. If called to do so, if you would like to do so, um, please do raise your hand for good order and uh, the moderator will call out uh, for you to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Um, we request that at all times during the session, you keep your video muted as well as, uh, sorry, your audio muted as well as your video off. Ladies and gentlemen, um, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being is important to building prosperous societies. Never before in our time has this been more evident than the current pandemic, which has demonstrated how a health emergency can negatively impact livelihoods. In recognition that healthy people are the foundation for healthy economies, the United Nations included good health and well-being as one of the sustainable goals a universal call to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Given the current substantial challenges facing global health, today's discussion is focused on sustainability in health and how we as business can contribute to this goal. Um, to this goal um, and then therefore today's session is actually quite timely in that regard. And so to kick us off, I want to recognize Chris Janassi, Chairman Hudson Sandler Africa, who are our partner in this initiative to give his opening remarks and set us going. Chris, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm obviously delighted to be here this morning uh, as the partner with Amchan for this Force for Good initiative. Um, Hudson Sandler is a corporate communications, ESG and sustainability consultancy. We have offices in Nairobi, Lagos and London. And we're advising multinational organizations on sustainability and ESG across the continent. So as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be involved as Amchan's partner in this initiative to really sort of shine a light on the excellent sustainability and social impact initiatives that Amcham members in Kenya. So without any further delay, I'd really like to ask our first speaker, Beatrice Gatumia from AMRAF, to, to give uh, the opening remarks and to give uh, the first presentation. Beatrice, thank you. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I will just um, focus on some of the work that we've done as AMREF Health Africa. And the hope is that by building context, we can be able to delve into a good discussion on how uh, private sector can participate sustainably in uh, supporting the achievement of universal health coverage. Next slide. So when we, think about the, when we think about the health system and when we think about achieving universal health coverage, there are six uh, basic building blocks that are universal to any health system um, globally. And so the purpose of this slide is just for the participants to think of, you know, a little about um, where do you fit in as a profit making organization, which one of these building blocks resonates the most with you. We have found that often um, one, one important uh, component of sustainability is ensuring that your participation is fit for purpose. Um, and so, you know, we won't go into the details of the six building blocks, but it's something that I want you to have uh, um, in your minds as we go through the discussion. 
uh, next slide. Um, so I'll touch uh, just very briefly on one of the uh, programs we've run as AMREF Health Africa. It's called IPUSH and it's run in Kakamega County. Um, so you'll see from the slide that there are a few statistics which are not necessarily unique to Kakamega, but these can be said of any, you know, most sub-Saharan um, countries and also most parts of, of, of Kenya. We have low uh, doctor to patient ratio, um, low nurse to patient ratio. The nurse to patient ratio is often better because it, you know, it takes a shorter time and it's cheaper to train nurses. Um, we also have um, uh, low per capita spending on health that, it, that then also limits choice in terms of what interventions can a person who is in the health system um, access. Um, and then of course, there's the, the one of the biggest challenges, which is the low coverage of health insurance. So here in Kakamega, it is, it's 23% across the population. Um, and in the country, it's uh, 17%. And that speaks to both private health insurance and national health insurance. Next slide. So what we set out to do uh, with the IPUSH program is leverage on some private sector um, innovations um, that, uh, you know, like for example, in the finance system, they form the backbone of how finance um, or uh, transactions are being conducted on a day to day. We found that there's a misconception that low income households don't save, uh, but the, the fact is that they do. The only difference is that they, they often save in, in, uh, on platforms that are more accessible. So introducing a mobile wallet um, was one of the steps that we took to encourage them to save specifically for health. And the premise is that if you can earmark some savings for health, then you're more likely, for example, to spend less out of pocket um, and hopefully more likely to pay up for your national health insurance um, if you accrue the, the savings uh, for, the, for the monthly payment um, every day, rather than um, at the end of the month, you have to make one big uh, payment. We also use mobile learning uh, tools. So mobile learning tools are not something that is a, is a foreign idea in private sector. Um, it's not a foreign idea, even within the education system, but it's not highly used when we talk about the public health uh, space. So the purpose of these mobile tools was to ensure that we could empower the community health worker. So you'll see from the picture on the slide that there's a gentleman with a, with a um, uh, an eye push um, vest on, and that is a community health worker. So the way that the primary health sector is uh, set up in, in Kenya and in most of Africa is that these community health workers who are um, often volunteers go door to door paying um, visits to households. And when they make that visit, they have very specific health information to pass on. Um, they'll follow up on people who live with uh, communicable diseases with that, within that household. The only um, challenge is that most of these are volunteers and so they are making those visits you know, in, their, in their free time. However, for the program, what we wanted to do is um, assess the, the potential to educate this uh, cohort of health workers using mobile tools. So reducing the need for classroom training and, and reducing the cost uh, of training. Um, the other thing that we've had to do is work on policy. So that's the sustainability component. How do you ensure that the interventions are supported within um, government frameworks? Um, and that is particularly to support also things like funding because uh, you, you know, uh, for, for the county government or any government for that matter to um, earmark funds for specific activities, often policy has to drive um, uh, you know, that, that decision. And then finally, we had a component in quality improvement. So we know that half of all healthcare in Africa is provided through private sector. Um, and with the challenges with private sector is that there's often a wide range in terms of quality. Um, it's very fragmented, uh, but the, it's, it's the reality that the public sector will not be able to support 100% um, delivery of health services. And so for us, so we were working with a mix of health facilities to deliver a quality program, quality improvement programs that again are designed for private sector, but are being deployed within the public health space. Next slide. 
So when we think about the challenges um, and opportunities, I think it's important to realize that the challenges do present the opportunities. We know that, uh, you know, at Africa, health is improving, people are living longer, and the population is also increasing. So naturally, there'll be a, an increased demand for health and well-being services, which means that potentially um, it could be a valuable in investment for, for private sector players. Uh, we also know that one of the biggest uh, delays and challenges to um, private sector is the regulatory environment is so fragmented across Africa. And so anytime you have new uh, diagnostics or new medicines or um, new medical equipment, you have to get regulatory approval country to country because there's a lack of harmonization. Um, the per capita spending um, on, on health is still pretty low. On average, it's $60, uh, dollars, you know, and when you compare that to, let's say, $4,000 in developing, in developed countries, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a drop um, in the bucket. So I think when we think about this space and what uh, opportunities are available, it's important to think broadly. Um, it's also important to think about, um, you know, what, what is the core mission of the organization? Who wants to? Um, sorry, I think you have an echo. Who wants to get involved in the in the health space? Um, so we see that innovation is one area, and that could you know be in a variety of ways. It could be by providing low cost diagnostics or medical technologies for developing countries. I think COVID nineteen teaches us a big lesson um, on that a value for innovation. Uh, because of course, the, um, initially when the when the pandemic began, diagnostics were um, largely un un uh, unattainable for most countries because of the cost. Um, and then with time, when China was um, begin began to develop lower cost diagnostics, then then testing became more accessible. Even if that testing has pr primarily been uh, meant, you know, uh, high out of pocket payments for. Uh, households, at least there's, there's more access because of the low cost, lower cost of, of these diagnostics and tools. Um, there are also uh, private public partnerships. I think those are, are uh, traditional within other sectors like energy, agriculture, and, uh, and uh, infrastructure. I think in health, we are finding that there's a difficulty in ensuring that you have the, the payers um, who, um, uh, you know, determined very clearly because at some levels of uh, healthcare, there, you know, there are no user fees. Um, so I think that, that has been challenging, but it still potentially provides uh, an opportunity for a return on investment for entities who you know, would like to explore um, what, you know, that kind of uh, innovative approach to uh, public health funding. I think demand creation is one other big thing that we often don't think about. So, um, how do you ensure that you know there's a demand for new, um, you know, new diagnostics, new medicines? Um, again, if we draw from COVID-19, we can see that the demand for the vaccine, whereas it's driven primarily by um, the the negative impact uh, of COVID, the, the the market shaping that has taken place is going to support further uptake of the vaccine once private sector is allowed to. Uh, distribute it within, within Africa. Um, of course, again, the market size might not be as uh, significant as what you would get in, the, in North America or, or uh, in Europe. But my, my point is that if we you know, participate, uh, if private sector can participate in driving demand, in shaping markets, uh, and improving the, um, the, the framework within which um, commercial entities can function, I think it, it allows them to unlock the value uh, that is uh, available in this uh, developing country markets. Um, then there's financing. I think one of the things that's very clear is that the, the private sector will continue to be a, a significant player in terms of health service provision, um, I, but often this, private facilities, they don't have access to capital. Um, they're limited in their ability to provide um, extensive uh, services because often it's a one man or, or one woman show for that matter. But their co collective untapped value might also be uh, you know, useful for not only driving universal health coverage, but also allowing the, the private sector players to have access um, to a more ready uh, market. 
So those are my you know, few thoughts on how private sector can participate uh, sustainably. I think it's important to recognize that there has to be a fit for the overall um, organization's own mandate um, and, and vision as we you know, consider what kind of participation would be worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for um, very interesting uh, insights there when it comes to private sector opportunities and some of the challenges that can be resolved through innovation and, and other models uh, for the health sector. So um, I'd like to bring in our second speaker, uh, Umra Omar, who's the founder and executive director at uh, Safari Doctors Initiative to give her presentation. Thank you, Maxwell, and thank you, um, British, for that valuable presentation. Um, again, I'm Umra from Lamu County, uh, founder and ED of Safari Doctors, which is a, a community-based uh, social enterprise around delivering primary health care in rural areas of Lamu County, founded in 2015. And our focus has been primarily around um, using the word safari to really highlight the challenge that um, traveling is in uh, when accessing healthcare, especially in a geographically complex area like Lamu County, where we travel by ocean, travel by road, the insecurities um, due to bordering um, Somalia, the terror threats that we've had and attacks from 2014 um, in Peketoni, which was the nexus of us um, founding this organization. So Safari is about, it's not a luxury in the, when it comes to healthcare, is that Africa's population, Kenya, over 70% is in rural areas, um, yet healthcare is so centralized. Um, healthcare has been seen as treating illness as opposed to preventing it. So we put a major emphasis on um, investing in community health worker systems and using the youth specifically. So for the last seven years, um, we've been very fortunate to um, put out a model that ensures we can reach 29 villages on a monthly basis and taking the medics to the community versus um, waiting for the community to come to the facilities when needed. So the next slide is where we are now in 2021 in extending a, a partnership with uh, BOMU Hospital, um, which again is a not-for-profit, an NGO hospital that um, has had roots in the coastal strip um, of Kenya. And the idea is that we have to have a health model that goes from the first mile, which means from the doorstep of that child that needs a vaccine, from the doorstep of that mother that needs to deliver, as opposed to waiting for them to come to the doorstep of the hospital when they've had complexities um, in their birth. So, and how do we do this by leveraging Africa's um, biggest, uh, biggest input, which is the youth. So we have a youth health ambassador program as well that as you see the lady on the right is a young lady in a village on Lamo Island and equipped with a mobile to help us with the data entry and collection, um, knows her community and is able to feed in to our clinics and our program. So what we have is a tentacle uh, model that we're now partnering with BOMO to ensure that we can serve all the way to the tertiary level um, of healthcare. So when we do have a referral, where that gets to. So the next slide illustrates the three prongs of achieving the universal healthcare that we're talking about. And the first one is the issue of access, which is where Safari Doctors comes in with their medic um, outreach programs. And the second one is around quality, which um, you mentioned, um, Beatrice, very well, that you know the, the standardization of care um, is not consistent. So we plan to have that center for excellence where community health workers um, can be up to date with their training, whether it's nursing programs, um, research on tropical diseases and partnerships with global um, entities as well. And the third one, which actually is usually considered as the priority in health is the facility itself. So what we're talking about is decolonizing 
um, uh, healthcare. It's about getting to that first mile, um, restructuring our models, the same way we've seen it happening in the banking sector with M-Pesa bringing um, banking to the fingertips of those marginalized, those that can cannot have the credit um, or the reference to be able to open bank accounts. Um, we've seen it happening with education, especially in this year of COVID, where, you know, from the digital learning and such spaces. So how do we do this exact same thing with healthcare so that it's an institutionalized model as opposed to a purely private sector or um, NGO. So the next slide kind of uh, paints a picture of how the social enterprise is actually valuable. And for us, Wailamu is a, a perfect case study to do this. Um, number one is that from our medical outreach, it means that with the push on um, NHIF um, coverage, it means that safari doctors and BOMO through this entity called Shungwaya will not be relying on insurance when people come to your uh, infrastructure, but you're a mobile um, uh, entity that can have clientele at their doorstep from the very first mile. It also has the revenue stream of um, around quality assurance around um, training or retraining, around hosting academic institutions. And then last but not least is that Lamu County has uh, no um, public-private um, partnership in a level four. We're purely relying on uh, government hospitals at the moment. There's a huge mega infrastructure project that's happening with the Lapsed Corridor, the biggest port right at our doorsteps. But yet all these social welfare and healthcare investments um, are yet to, to, to come into fruition. So we have a lot of referrals going to Malindi and Mombasa. Um, uh, we have a lot of cases that don't have that um, capacity. So it's welcoming on board um, ideas and partnerships on how universal healthcare can be a holistic model that serves that very, um, you know, forgotten um, Wana Inchi in the Boni Forest where, you know, when facilities are fleeing, when hospitals, um, government hospitals are being closed down, how do we come up with these innovative models of taking healthcare to the people as opposed to waiting for the people when they're in their most vulnerable situation having um, to come to, to access healthcare. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Umra. I, that's a really interesting um, initiative that you have, and I think you're, you're spot on. At the greatest need is actually at that very primary level of healthcare, and not so much the more, um, if I may use the term, last mile, <laughs> uh, which is opposite of what you're focusing on. And I think it's something that is really needed, especially as you go into um, the country, into the hinterland. Uh, that obvious gap is one that needs to be to be filled and I'm glad that we have organizations such as yours who are you know creating initiatives towards uh, fulfilling that need so thank you I'm sure we'll interact some more during uh, the panel discussion so at this point I want to bring in um, Eric Eric Angula is the head of strategy and partnerships uh, for global health uh, Africa at Medtronic Labs Eric the screen is yours yeah, thank you so much, uh, Maxwell and uh, Umra for that presentation. I mean, it's a great work uh, that Safari Doctors is doing in very remote areas. And really, uh, as Metronic Labs, that's also what we're focusing on, uh, you know, really looking at the underserved patient populations and really, um, you know, being driven by a mission to create access for such um, you know, underserved patient populations. So in case uh, my internet um, is a bit uh, uh, hazy, please uh, just let me know and I'll turn off my video. So next slide, Eva. So Medtronic Labs is um, <clears throat> ideally an independent social enterprise um, organization incorporated as a public benefit um, corporation and funded by Medtronic uh, um, Inc. Foundation, and we are a 501c3 um, organization um, incorporated in the US, in India, and as well uh, in Ghana and also in Kenya. 
So today our focus is really on underserved patient populations and the ability to really create access through uh, innovative technologies. Um, our work currently is really focused on high tech, high touch um, uh, care delivery models uh, that really focus on NCDs. So today in terms of our pipeline, we've uh, focused on hypertension, diabetes, obesity, as well as other comorbidities. Um, but we are quickly ramping up on mental health uh, just as an inclusion into that bucket. So our technology actually achieves, um, uh, you know, this um, access and, you know, being able to uh, drive patients towards, uh, you know, specific outcomes through uh, three different areas that is screening, uh, assessments, as well as, uh, you know, being able to link patients to care and also being able to provide that data-driven, um, uh, you know, communications and telecounseling that supports patients uh, within the rural areas. So for us really to amplify this impact and to reach uh, this scale, we believe in partnerships. Partnerships is a very strong um, avenue for us uh, re really to be able to move the needle uh, in terms of um, NCDs, you know, creating awareness, uh, basically all the way uh, towards, you know, um, positive outcomes for our patients um, living with these conditions. We have a very ambitious goal really to be able to uh, um, measurably improve the health outcomes for about 25 million plus underserved patient populations by 2025. And uh, next slide, Iva. And as Medtronic Labs, really, if you look at our portfolio today, um, we have a very strong, uh, you know, leaning towards NCDs. And I think this is because all of us in this room understand the challenges with NCDs, um, you know, today, uh, which has actually even overtaken uh, communicable diseases in terms of, you know, um, admissions, in terms of um, even mortality. And if you look at even this era of COVID, then the burden is really, really, um, uh, you know, so much on patients who with, with these conditions or living with these conditions. So as an organization, uh, we have these three uh, offerings. So Empower Health is a solution that uh, I'll discuss, I think is relevant for us in this forum. Um, which is really just hypertension, diabetes, and as I mentioned, obesity, working very closely with the Ministry of Health uh, in Kenya. And also we have another solution called Prena, which is basically in Asia, uh, India, and then also in the Philippines that uh, focuses on addressing hypertension and diabetes within uh, group settings. And then of course, our flagship program, which is Shruti, uh, really ear disease started off as uh, an innovation, a product, you know, that we put in the hands of uh, CHVs, community health volunteers, and they're able to screen for, uh, for ear disease at the community level. They're able to refer patients early enough, uh, and then we are also able to provide very low cost uh, hearing aids uh, in Asia. So as an organization, uh, just within four years, we've been able to have today 110 employees of which 93% of those are within the localities or geographies where we work. Um, we, we've been ramping up our activities really, um, and as an organization, we focus uh, on improvement of lives of patients who uh, we are managing with these conditions. And today, uh, in terms of um, you know, lives improved, which we track, and uh, hopefully maybe we could have another forum just to be able to discuss this a little bit further, in terms of outcomes, uh, about 30,000. Next slide, Eva. So really our solution in terms of community-based management is really focused towards being able to address the um, longitudinal management capabilities for patients at the community level and really being able to address um, issues of compliance, adherence, lifestyle changes, lifestyle behaviors, uh, social determinants of health at community level, household level, and we leverage technology to be able to do this. So today, um, the, the workflows are organized in a way that, yes, we are able to screen um, at the community level. And this is primarily because the challenge with NCDs is the uh, undiagonized uh, you know, people or populations that are working out there. And we've seen very, you know, very, very high uh, you know, blood pressures uh, blood sugars, wherever we do some of the community-based screenings, um, you know, a BP of 200 over, 
over over 90 or over 100 and uh, and somebody is just walking uh, you know without that knowledge so what essentially we want to do is to be able to provide that opportunity to identify these people in the populations but also be able to link them to care so the tool empower health tool is built in with algorithms that helps to risk stratify patients and it's actually um, a tool that um, you know borrows heavily from the Ministry of Health patient files and patient tools, and this is a partnership that we are currently running uh, with uh, the Ministry of Health Kenya, and uh, the ability to also you know generate personalized care plans. As we know today, every single patient is seen every month, and uh, no two patients are the same, of course. And with comorbidities, it's important for us to be able to see patients. Uh, and to be able to stratify them so that we see the high risk patients and be able to provide opportunity to even educate them, uh, something that is really missing today within our public sector. So then the blood glucose or uh, blood pressure checks happens actually in the community and we work very closely within the government structures, uh, the health system structures of uh, you know, community health volunteers, and uh, we've expanded this now to also work with uh, peer educators. So these are patients who are living with the conditions. Um, you know, we bring them together within support groups, we train them, and they're able to support to ensure that uh, patients are able to, you know, um, to do their blood pressure checks. During COVID-19, uh, you know, the first wave and the second wave, we took an initiative to call all patients uh, within the counties where we're working. Um, who attended these clinics. And you know, what came up really was uh, quite uh, painful in the sense that patients could not actually even have their blood pressure checked because they could not go to the facilities. They were afraid um, you know, that once they get out there, they, they contract uh, COVID and you know, the verdict is death. So even patients who are in, on insulin you know, were not able to, um, to access you know, these uh, very much needed commodities. So it was really um, uh, a pathetic situation for patients living with NCDs. So then the community aspect, just to ensure that patients have, you know, a closer access to, um, to a blood pressure check happens also with the support of the CHPs. And all this data is collected into the app. The app works real time and is able to give notifications to support, um, you know, uh, you know, to 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 support with uh, notifications if the patients are uh, are not are not doing well, if there are elevated readings, and if their symptoms are also not, uh, you know, not good, and uh, this can work actually both online and offline, uh, just because of the community aspects. Mm -hmm. So then, once that happens in the community, then at the facility, the clinicians or the providers are able to view that also in real time and are able to, again, uh, communicate again through an SMS uh, through the same platform or call the patients or just invite the patients to come to the facility um, immediately. And you know, with support of telecounseling uh, that we also provide at the back end, just to ensure that patients who are lost to follow up, defaulters, or patients who have been identified with high risk are actually seen as quickly as possible just to be able to avoid complications. The element of e-prescriptions really uh, is something that we are currently uh, pursuing, just looking at community pharmacies. As you know, today we have a very big challenge with availability of commodity within the public sector. Next slide. So maybe just, uh, just a brief, this is just to demonstrate the workflows uh, on what Empower Health uh, you know, software is. So we have been able to combine the, the software with other you know, wraparound services. So in terms of um, health worker training, in terms of the clinical aspects, guidelines, um, and being able to provide also the diagnostic kits uh, actually to the CHVs and to the peer educators, to, to the support groups as well, uh, just to enable them to be able to check their, their readings. And we've also been able to incorporate um, you know, and to work closely with the Ministry of Health in terms of the um, you know, peer educator guidelines, uh, curriculum you know, for training. Next slide. So in terms of the, the tech uh, side of things, we want to incorporate, our, our main vision is really to be able to incorporate um, a technology uh, you know, driven or powered service. 
really for uh, for health access and uh, also enabling enabling that to be um, uh, you know modular uh, that can be customized uh, based on the need. So today, the the four aspects uh, you know that are that that are, are embedded uh, you know within the model of care really is the core tech platform uh, that really drives um, the longitudinal management uh, of patients, but then also integrating that with diagnostics, which as we know also is a big challenge within the public sector facilities. Then of course the operations and you know, being able to work with the counties very closely in terms of screening, creating awareness, and really ensure that we identify patients with these conditions and that they don't default. The main objective is really to drive patients towards positive outcomes, but also most importantly, really to, uh, you know, to, to, to focus on um, you know, patients' uh, quality of life. Then of course we have other patient facing services. Uh, for example, you know, the SMS capabilities, next slide Eva, and where we have actually um, leveraged on technology also to be able to ensure that yes, the telecounselors can reach the patients. Um, during COVID, we were also able to put patients on WhatsApp groups where we had clinicians and you know, just generally providing that education. And today we have moved and uh, you know, we are providing a USSD capabilities for those with feature phones. Mm -hmm. And we work also very closely, as we mentioned, with partners such as InfoBib that provide uh, this core platform for this to happen. So we are actually focused towards blending both in-person uh, you know, clinic visits uh, with, the, with the providers, but then also ensuring that using technology patients can still be remotely managed, remotely monitored um, efficiently, just to drive them towards adherence to be able to reduce complications. Next slide. In terms of uh, data and reporting, this has also been one of the biggest challenges within the NCD space. Um, in terms of even being able to access you know, patients who are controlled and controlled, patients who are on treatment, uh, being able to really get the true you know, prevalence and burden of these conditions. Uh, the last, I think, step survey was done in 2015. Of course, things are very, very different uh, at this point in time. So using the system, we are also able to provide um, you know, critical uh, you know, reporting uh, through the Ministry of Health as well into um, Kenya Health Information Systems through MOH 740, specifically for NCDs. And we're also able to produce um, you know, uh, quality data analytics, uh, you know, build cascades that uh, are able to inform policy and, and are also able to inform decision making both at the facility level, the county level, and also at the national level. So uh, there's a lot actually really to discuss. But I will stop at that and uh, looking forward to the interaction session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, for that. And it's great to hear what Medtronic Labs is doing. Um, it's actually quite comprehensive, and I'm glad that uh, you have this opportunity to hear from you. So at this juncture, I'll hand over to Rebecca, who's going to moderate the panel discussion. Rebecca, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Maxwell, and thank you, Beatrice, Umra, and Eric for absolutely fascinating um, presentations and overviews. I've got a few questions, and one's come in already from the audience, but if anyone else, or, or the participants, if anyone else would like to put some questions, please type them in, put your hand up, and we will definitely come to you. I want this to be an interactive um, conversation. Um, I think, I, I think I'm going to make a comment, first of all, because I'm sitting here in London, and, um, you know, like, every other country around the world, we are kind of still recovering after the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on our health systems, which are considered to be, you know, well-established, well-developed, mature. But what I notice from all of your presentations is the innovation that we're seeing through some of the solutions you put in place far outstrips anything that, that the developed nations can, can actually even hope to achieve, because we have such established healthcare systems there it's like trying to turn a super tank around in the ocean. They take an awfully long time. There is a nimbleness, I think I saw there. There is, a, there's, you know, the, the need to drive innovation, 
to actually get healthcare out to rural communities is there. And I think it's um, I think it's much more dynamic the situation you're dealing with in Kenya. So I think there are definitely some advantages and some things that you know more developed nations can learn from. Um, I want to ask all three of you first of all. What one thing do you think is hindering progress at the moment? What one change could be made? And it, it might be funding, it might be, a, it might be policy change, it might be anything. But what one thing is hindering you being able to um, impact as many people as you want through the systems you're operating? Beatrice, can I start with you maybe? Yes, uh, thanks, Rebecca. I honestly think that it's the public participation. I think that the public is not, um, you know, taking initiative enough to demand for the health services that they need, to demand for the quality that is required. Um, I think they're not participating enough to demand for transparency on government spending. Um, so there's just a lack of, you know, push from from the from the grassroots, as it were. Uh, so empowering them, I think, would be something that is valuable in driving the, the momentum um, so that, you know, the change is not only led by, um, by government or by donors, but it's the people, the people's voice is rising to the top. Um, and, you know, I think when the people speak, governments have to listen. So I think that's one thing that if, if I could wave a wand, I would wave a wand and, you know, yeah, <laughs> encourage public participation. Thank you. Umra, now you have very specific, because you're dealing in a very, very specific area in Lamu County, what one thing would you like to see? So mine is actually the opposite of uh, what Beatrice is experiencing. For me, it's the poor leadership. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm running for office for Lamu governorship um, because of that frustration is that we have the Abuja declaration of, you know, 15% going into healthcare. That's not happening. And uh, I think that's because of the leadership side. We're talking of um, funding allocation. You know, we had COVID resources being embezzled like in broad daylight. That's nothing to do with the public, it's to do with the corruption at the highest level at a time when, you know, Africa and Kenya was in most need. So for me, it's um, that big brother not delivering. And uh, when you look at communities like in Lamu, where somebody is more worried about getting daily bread for the day, living, you know, under $2 a day, more than, you know, waging a protest or sitting to start holding um, the government accountable. So I really wish that there was um, a more intentional approach, I think, from our governance structure, compensating community health workers, the policies in order um, to do that. And the public has elected certain leaders with the hope or the intention that that is uh, what would be happening in the corridors of power. So I would go on our governance structures being a little bit um, problematic when it comes to delivering. And actually, I noticed that governance was one of Beatrice's six segments. Um, and I suppose that's governance, not just of the healthcare providers or the, or the, you know, the NGOs or the delivery service providers. It's actually governance at, at, at the highest level as well, making yeah. sure that there is a, that regulatory framework and you can trust it. Yeah. Eric, from your point of view, um, you have a you have systems that that actually work remotely because you are so technology led. But is there one thing you would like to see um, improved in Kenya, or is there you know, is there one element that, if that happened, you feel you could actually expand and impact a lot more people? Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I think before I go, I want to also congratulate Umra for that bold step. We vote for you. I think we need a change. Uh, we will. Put your hands up. <laughs> yes. So I, I think for me, yeah, for me really is the uh, policy change because uh, you know today, if you look at even chronic uh, you know diseases, and within the counties, um, what is uh, said is that you know the healthcare is free up until level three. Um, from level four in several counties, you know, then patients would pay for. Uh, for the drugs but what we have seen having working you know been working on the ground really in some of the counties is that for a patient to really go for the medications they have to travel and they pay transport fees on a motorbike border border up until 1000 kenya shillings now 
That is one way. So two ways is about 2,000. So what essentially that means is that the drugs that this patient is going for would be costing uh, for a, about 400 shillings. So the patient is spending 2,000 to get drugs for, four, for 400 shillings. So definitely what we are saying is that the patient will not be compliant, that's one. Uh, we are going to lose so many patients and that's why there's a, you know, a, a very significant increase in terms of uh, managing complications related to these conditions. So what we would want to drive towards is why can't we make these commodities available at level three facilities or level two facilities, some of them where these patients are coming close to. Yes, we know there's a Kenya essential medicines list that have prescribed certain, um, certain medications that could be available at level threes, but that is still not happening. So even though patients are going to the level three for free, uh, you know, service, but they cannot access the commodities and that is what drives better outcomes. So until, up until that is done, and I'm happy that the newly, uh, you know, produced uh, or released or launched uh, the Kenya National um, NCD strategic, uh, you know, policy document, uh, it, it, you know, begins to address some of these issues. And in terms of that, uh, we are trying to, you know, to actually move the needle in terms of uh, ensuring that for, you know, whichever way possible that these drugs patients can access them closer to where they're coming from. The issue of the CHVs is a totally different issue altogether. Yes, we say that, you know, the community health strategy is a critical component in driving even UHC, in driving, uh, you know, primary uh, healthcare networks. But if we don't recognize the CHVs and CHWs, then what are we saying? You know, they don't have a terms of service, but yet in our, all our documents, and I believe Dr. Beatrice, uh, you work very closely with the CHWs uh, all over the place. Dr. I mean, Umbra, you work with them, but they don't have a terms of service. And yet we all of us acknowledge the critical role that they play. So what are we saying, you know? So I think for me, we need to really be able to drive that policy change and we need to really relook really at the healthcare system and look at where can we make the greatest uh, impact. I know these discussions have been made, UHC, uh, but we are still not doing the right things, unfortunately. Yeah. I can see, I can see governments at the most senior level going through all of those. So Beatrice is, 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 is asking for the community or for, for people to actually ask more of their government. Umra is very much the, that she should be in government running this place because, because change needs to come. And Eric, I can see that, you know, what comes out of that governance would be infrastructure that would allow, allow you to address some of the problems that I don't think a lot of people would even consider. So um, Amcham is here to represent, you know, big global businesses that have Kenyan operations that are here working in Kenya and want to support the community. Now I work with, I've worked with a lot of big international companies. I work with a lot of African companies that work across lots of, um, lots of markets. And, you know, health is one of the things when they're thinking about their CSR and their sustainability programs, health is always one of the first, it's health and education, the two things that people always think about, or organizations think about in terms of where they should be placing their support. But they think about, I think, and I'm, I apologize if I'm being unfair to any companies, they think, they think about the, the health risks that we all know about. They think about the non-communicable diseases, they think about the impact of the pandemic, they think about malaria, they think about all of those sorts of issues. They don't think about some of the practicalities that it actually it's going to cost 2,000 shillings for someone to go and get some medicine that costs significantly less than that. So there is the whole infrastructure thing around that. And I was just thinking about um, the role that the private sector can play, not in the, not healthcare providers, um, but some of the members of AMCHAM who come from a whole range of different, you know, different services and sectors who want to build help, you know, support for healthcare services in, um, in Kenya into their CSR and their sort of charitable giving programs. How can, can, can CSR programs really have an impact? first of all, and how do, you know, I think Beatrice said there are 50% of healthcare in Kenya is delivered through, you know, through the private sector. It's very fragmented. There's all sorts of different standards. How do companies actually start to identify where they can really make a difference 
and how they can how they can have an impact, who they need to work with, what the standards are, and um, if they should be working together, if you should bring lots of companies together to build a kind of a bigger fund to go and fund bigger things rather than this very fragmented approach. Beatrice, do you have a view on that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rebecca. So I, I think, first of all, that um, CSR makes a difference. It's short term often, um, which is not necessarily bad. But I think that the question we should really ask, which is why in my, in my first slide, I was challenging um, participants to think about where do they fit in as an organization? Because you're more likely to um, stay the journey and see it through um, if you know, the, the thing is at also at the core of your business. So if um, innovation in technology, you know, like what Medtronics is doing, that basically it's health management uh, information system that allows you to, to track uh, patients and potentially provide better outcomes for them. So one, are, is your purpose um, aligned to this thing that you want to do in the health sector? I think the truth is it also requires a lot of courage because if you think about the, the challenges, um, the, there's so little that you can control. You can't control, uh, you know, well, okay, you could, um, who is in government, um, you know, what gets to the, to, um, to the grassroots, um, so there's so many things that are, you know, up in the air. So you need courage to, to be de and determination to stay in, in that game for, for the long term. I think that um, whereas sometimes we don't immediately see um, impact, th there is impact. If you think about some of the uh, programs, I mean, uh, GSK is close to my heart because that was my uh, immersion into the access medicine space. Um, and, and also just beginning to understand that company goodwill is one thing, but the environmental regulatory challenges can be so disheartening um, that it's sometimes easier to pull the plug on innovation because, you know, you can't see the day that uh, coming to light that you deliver this great innovation. But now they're launching their vaccine for malaria, which potentially will save hundreds of millions, uh, you know, millions of lives um, in, in the next, you know, 10 years. So I think there needs to be determination. I think there needs to be long-term uh, thinking. I think there needs to be a very close collaboration with country partners so that you're relevant to the, to, you know, to what's um, coming up and, and to the things that are changing even as governments uh, shift uh, in, in and out. So yes, yeah, so there's a role, uh, but there needs to be courage and determination to be in it for the long term. Do you work with, do you have like private sector partners who through their CSR campaigns are, or through their charitable giving are supporting the work you're doing in Lano? Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, we've been very fortunate for being what we call a global organization, like globally local. Um, and given the fact that what you say happens with big institutions um, taking on um, supporting entities is a little bit tricky when 1% of what usually goes through these huge entities actually trickles down to the communities that um, need to be served. So for example, we've had support through Bayers where you know, they match fund a staff that wants to um, support whatever project. Although that's like $2,500 and then they match you, that's $5,000 huge project when it's going to a young person in a village to do you know a project in um, uh, in their community so the challenge that we have with the CSR is that it has to trickle down to the first mile um, as opposed to getting stuck um, somewhere in between we get support from a lot of um, American family um, foundations as well yeah. and now what we've been fortunate that we got the media exposure through the CNN Heroes Award in 2016 but that was a classic example of showing how putting a spotlight or support in some CBO somewhere and seeing that through could actually glow uh, like give you a glow stable um, organization and in support we're talking it's not just funding we're talking like we say the accreditation the media exposure it's the institutional um, uh, partnership it's the amplifying the voices that are there on the ground so CSR can be in so many versions as opposed to you know we made this much about the profit line where can we chunk um, the extra funds that we have so I would urge our CSR model to be more thoughtful um, and more holistic. 
One of the things um, that all companies, are, as you know, all companies at the moment that have investors or the investment community is looking at are all looking at their own ESG ratings. They're all looking at how they, you know, how they are, are they doing the right thing environmentally, socially, and through their governance? Um, so they are all now increasingly looking at how they can support local communities, the role they can play in society. So there is a lot more going into this. But to do that, to make the choices of where they are going to fund different projects, a lot of, a lot of the private sector will look for data. They will want to know that they are having an impact. And um, now, Eric, I know we, there was a lot of data that you could provide, and I suppose that's the advantage of working with technology is you have that data. How is it, do you think, for, for Umra and for Beatrice, who are perhaps working in a slightly, you know, it's a less sort of controlled area in terms of outcomes, how can you convince, um, invent, convince the public, the, the private sector, that you are actually having an impact so that they then might be encouraged to stick with you for the long term rather than it being this very short term kind of CSR funding that Beatrice talked about? Then that becomes one of the things that they invest in, you know, like supporting um, an entity, not only CSR, but how to gather that data. Maybe that's a department that needs to, to be in, in the work that they do so that you don't have, you know, very deserving or very needy because by virtue of rural or remote or in these areas where it's the communities on the ground that know best how yet lack that tool, then let's devise, you know, institutions or structures that would help bring that out of what they're doing versus saying, okay, you know, this is something in Kisumu, they don't even know how to do a spreadsheet, therefore let's yeah. let's not do it. But that becomes one of the CSR investments is getting somebody, an entity, a consultant, or even within your own entity to be like, okay, here's a worthy project. This is what they're lacking. So that becomes one of the things that we're investing in. So actually, there's much more engagement between the between the, the funding company and the and the delivering organization, because I think a lot of organizations say, oh, we're just funding this, we're giving money to this organization, and that's as far as it goes. Um, but actually getting more involved, being more on the ground, actually delivering and working in, in it, it partnership. Be, it can't be just like, you yeah. know, throwing dollars into the sky. Yeah, no, agreed. Yeah. And... Maybe just to mention also that, you know, that has been, you know, the norm and, uh, you know, rightfully it's been driven by uh, big fundings, especially within the infectious space, like, you know, Global Fund, you know, PEPFA, those are like big, big monies. And I'll be biased a little bit uh, because that's what, you know, we are also passionate about. And if you look at investments coming that direction is actually zero, you know, so to speak today. But um, for me, really, the private sector and whether it's CSR funding, you know, whether it's you know, direct funding from any of these private sector organizations really should be catalytic. The way we need to look at it is that is catalytic funding that should drive um, you know, scale and should drive sustainability in terms of how these programs are implemented. Otherwise, we would still go back uh, to the areas, you know, to the yeah, you know, days of uh, you know, a TB project has been implemented and that's it, gone, finished. Uh, we give the county all the computers and the vehicle and then that's it, we pack up and leave. But the patient is still there, the relatives of, of those patients are still there. So for me, I think really from private sector side, what needs to be driven, and I, I love, uh, you know, the aspect uh, that you mentioned, Rebecca, on data. Uh, because if we have to advocate for any single thing, we need to change tact because we've made a lot of noise uh, on what needs to be done. All of us in this, in this, you know, in this, in this room and in this meeting, really, we know what needs to be done, right? But we've been making noise, but we cannot be able to produce the evidence why we need to change things today. So, as an organization, really, our core um, dream, our our vision is to start using this data really to be able to drive investments. Uh, in terms of implementation of some of these programs, but most importantly, working very closely with the government and we need to change the mindset of the government. One other thing that happens is that government looks at private sector as an enemy, as uh, you know, somebody who has ulterior motives. You know, they're coming in, what do you want? So the first, the first thing they ask is what do you want? You know, mm. 
it could be just you know plain and you know noble objective to be able to support uh, the activities that the government is doing. So that I think also plays a very significant part. Yes, certain things have happened in the past, you know, from the private sector side, of course, driven by uh, you know their own specific objectives. But I think where we are today, the pie is is is, is so big that cannot be solved by one entity. And then I think to the private sector also looking at each other suspiciously. You know, if I'm working in a county, let's say if I go to Lamu County as Metronic Labs, I know safari doctors have been there for, for ages. So why do I want to run my own program? Why can't I just approach Umra and say, hey, we would like to do one or two things. What is the opportunity for us to collaborate to even reach a wider uh, you know, population? So that I think also from the, from the private sector is something that we are doing very wrong. Everybody wants to do their own thing, right? So you find in one county, we have three, four implementers. Every single person is paying the same CHVs uh, as Tipine. So why, why are we doing that, you know? Yeah. So that's also a very significant uh, area that uh, you know, we need to, uh, to change our mindset on. Yes, I absolutely agree. And if you think about the SDGs, so clearly everyone here is focused on SDG three, um, good health and well-being. But actually, I always think because they are all so interrelated, they all, you know, they don't they don't exist in in isolation. So I always think the last one, SDG seventeen, which is partnerships for the goals, is possibly the one that kind of sticks everything together. And I can absolutely see, you know, when Beatrice said it's a very fragmented market in terms of you know the different private providers actually if you can all work together if there was partnerships at that level not just with the private sector sitting outside and not just with government actually there is a, a, the potential to do some really you know to, to, to really start to pull it together and build something that's akin to a national health service if you could do it on scale and we've had a few questions in from the audience that I just want to put to you the first one that came in very early on while the presentations were still going on are the community healthcare, it was one around the community healthcare volunteers um, and the absolutely vital role that they play. Everyone relies on the community healthcare volunteers and Eric, as you say, they're, they're being used across several different initiatives and through different, several different organisations. Um, but Charles Ruto asks, how do we make that a sustainable delivery model? You know, things like the pandemic show us that everything can be a little bit, you know, a little bit unstable if you cannot have face to face you know, communication. Um, so how do we when we're relying on volunteers, which by their very nature, you cannot rely on because they are volunteering. How do we make that a sustainable delivery um, system? Beatrice, do you? Have, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca, I, 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 I don't know whether I should answer that question, given that Charles is my colleague. So yeah, it's an <laughs> internal problem. So, but but anyway, I'll. I'll you can I'll, you can air your dirty linen here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, really. So I, I think I think the issue of CHVs and, and just like I mentioned, up until you know they are appreciated and recognized. Uh, within the health cadres and really given a term, a, a, you know, a, a terms of service that stipulates what their role truly is, I think it will still be the same problem uh, all over the place. And so I think then the call to action is the partners who are implementing programs uh, within the communities, then why can't we drive some of these discussions? Um, you know, even with the uh, Ministry of Health just to be able to you know, start advocating for this. I know AMREF has done quite a bit of work trying to you know, make this, uh, uh, you know, make the CHVs and CHWs uh, recognized within the uh, health uh, you know, system infrastructure, but uh, you know, that has not, has not uh, borne any fruit. So I think it's something that um, organizations that implement within their communities need to rally together to be able to drive this. So the second thing is within the counties, um, if for example, we have two or three partners and within the counties, then the discussion should be with the county leadership. How do we support your community health strategy, build capacity, provide opportunities for us to implement some of these programs within the, uh, the communities and really come together as partners. And then that again can, can help us to start demonstrating 
that really from the county level, uh, this thing can actually bubble up all the way to the national policy making uh, um, organs. So I, I think that contribution and then I'll pass it over to uh, just to answer that uh, to Charles Ruto as well is that it is happening and it is possible um, in Turkana County 2018, they had um, gazetted a supplement budget of actually absorbing community health workers. So they actually take care of 3000 health workers. So it's possible. It's just a matter of our government deciding and putting the resources um, to the policies and the resources to do that. Uh, yeah, so just to add on to what Erica and Umar have said, in our experience, I agree, yes, it does work. What we have found, however, is that it requires a lot of support um, in terms of advocacy, uh, helping the, you know, the leadership um, to think about the sustainability. I think for them, a big concern is once you make, you have policy and, and all of that, it means that you, there's an obligation. Um, and so they will, depending on the, which is to Umrah's point, depending on the leadership you have in place, you might have a quick win or years and years of, of back and forth. Um, but certainly th th there is hope. I think Nairobi and, and Kakamega also are recognizing the community health workers. Um, They're allowed a stipend and also an annual NHIF uh, cover, which is good. I think one challenge that we will probably continue to face with CHWs is determining um, their selection, because there's a wide range. You know, they are often um, have a low level of education, um, but yet we need them as a backbone of, of, of the community health structure. So I think that there's a lot um, to think about. It's not only how do we recognize them, but how do we select them? Um, you know, what, what do we want them to achieve? Uh, and how accurate do we want the information that they pass on to be? Uh, so I think there's a lot that needs to be thought out in that process of, you know, making sure that they're, they're formalized. Okay. Yeah, and that goes to your point about standards as well, I guess, because if you, if you have varying standards across, you know, across the country, across different, even different healthcare workers, then, mm -hmm. then you are going to, you, you get that, you get that fragmented approach. Um, we have another question in, and it's about the role that the private sector can play in um, in uh, encouraging the regulator, a better regulatory framework. So I'm going to read it out. Speakers have mentioned the regulatory framework as a challenge facing the health sector. How can the private sector be more deliberate in engaging and supporting regulation of the health sector so that service and product standards are improved for better health outcomes? So I guess this is a question about advocacy and the advocacy that you're doing as, as healthcare providers, but also, you know, other organizations who, who might want to fund or get involved or advocate to, to see an improvement, how can they actually do that? Well, we see, uh, sorry if I can just chip in, is that the, the private sector can um, help show how it should be done. Um, uh, by the virtue of what they support or what they help do. You see that in Kilifi with the uh, Camry, um, uh, which is a product of, um, you know, having a research facility working very close with the county. So from simple things like organizational values to staff trainings and so forth, you see that sipping into um, the Kilifi healthcare structure as well. So the private sector has that golden opportunity and space to help in showing what what the services could look like, what data collection could look like, what staff uh, motivation could look like, and then have this now um, uh, be that, um, what do you call it, that measuring um, yard of uh, health service delivery. So establishing a benchmark, benchmark by almost kind of setting up the model system that can In then be replicated. With the, the, the government structure. Yes, yeah. yes I can mm -hmm. see that. Beatrice, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I do. So I think another place area that is in you know, dire need is the regulators who are working to um, approve, give market authorization for new diagnostics, uh, new medicines. I think technical assistance to those kind of bodies, um, you know, it's a lot of political uh, wrangling that is necessary. But I think the truth is, if those bodies are not uh, strengthened in their ability to determine um, which, which uh, um, technologies are appropriate for the population, um, if the Ministry of Health does not have the capacity to 
determine uh, uh, pricing, cost effectiveness, all of that assessment that needs to be done that is part and parcel of the health system in a developing, uh, in a developed country. I think that it becomes um, fairly impossible to uh, attain universal health coverage because health will continue to be very expensive and you know, uh, 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 resources won't, won't be optimized. So I think that technical assistance um, is something that needs to be done. I think there could be uh, mechanisms which include placement of uh, experts within those institutions for a time so that there is direct on the job training for, for the local um, team and to develop their expertise uh, to a global standard. Yeah, Eric. briefly is just, you know, in terms of the regulators, um, I think the private sector really has a very big role to play. One, um, as Umra mentioned, not only because they, you know, they have the standards, they know what needs to be done and they can start driving those conversations, but they also can provide uh, the necessary technical support and funding to be able to drive and to start these conversations and to, uh, you know, to, you know, to drive the process as it starts. And I think a case in point is even the e-health bill um, that, you know, organizations such as, you know, Kenya Healthcare Federation has been really very much involved in. And uh, that, you know, demonstrates that, yes, um, the private sector can actually make a push, start the conversations, but also drive the process and really continue with that, with the advocacy, uh, uh, you know, with the regulators just to say that, we, look, we have uh, this group of, uh, you know, private sector investors, and this is what they, they are doing, but we need to provide guidance towards how that can be, uh, you know, implemented in a better and consistent way. So yes, there's a very, very big uh, role. Uh, that the private sector can play yeah wonderful thank you so much well the, the sun has come up in, in london as we've been as we've been talking um so the day started and i think that's 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 the end of our q a session unless I, I don't think there are any more kind of questions that really summed everything up from the from the um from our participants so i'm going to hand back to maxwell but thank you very much for a really fascinating conversation no, indeed, a very, very fascinating conversation. I, I have a question. The reason why I was turning on my video is I have a question that I'd like to, to throw at the panel. Um, if you look at our health industry, well, not industry actually, our health sector is structured more as a service. I think you'll agree. It's, it's more than a service that is being extended to, to um, you know, the citizenry and the population. However, I'm curious, how can we move from health being seen as a service to pivoting it to more of an industry so that it can really drive um, the right level of investment, um, especially from the private sector, the way you have other industries operating, if you take uh, you know, ICT and, and, and the rest. Um, and if you look at our health agenda, I think one of the key ambitions in there is to turn Kenya into a center um, for medical tourism for the region. Um, how do we get to that level of excellence, if I may put it that way, that allows the health space to actually become an industry the way we have in India or in the US? Any thoughts on how we can, we can bridge that bridge? Thanks, Maxwell. Um, I think that, I think that's a really good question. Uh, and the reality is for us to get to that place, there's, uh, we need to respond by increasing the capacity. So for example, if you think about uh, countries like India where medical tourism is, um, you know, is, is what they're known for, there's the capacity to absorb those additional um, people coming in. And that capacity has to do with expertise. Uh, so how, you know, what, how well exposed or how trained are the health workers in the, in the health space? And when I say health workers, I'm not only talking about the, the doctor, but even the nurse, because we know now from COVID-19 uh, that we needed, uh, you know, there was a whole push, get ventilators, so people get ventilators. And then in the hospital, there's not a single ICU nurse to run the, to manage the patient on the ventilator. So we have a capacity issue in terms of uh, health personnel. Um, I think the other thing is infrastructure. So hard uh, infrastructure, where are the hospitals? Um, that can absorb these people who are coming in, often for specialized care. And it could be the range of 
things, whether it's cosmetic care or whether it's medical care and in some cases prevention. So we need to be able to think about that as well. And then the demand, how do we create the demand for these services? So demand is driven, of course, one by need, so already you're sick, um, or you have the spending power. So I think we need to also, you know, the, the journey has to grow with the growth of the economy, because even if we, we you know, do what we can to create demand, as long as people can't pay for that care, um, it's impossible. So we need to uh, onboard manufacturing because our medicines need to be cheaper. Um, so if you have medical tourism, but expensive medication, then you can't compete with, with India. Um, and I guess, of course, India has the benefit of scale in terms of that uh, importation. So they, they, rather than, so for us, you know, we can't compete on numbers. So volume uh, will give you lower pricing, uh, generics will give you lower pricing. So I think we are, we have a lot to do. We need to up manufacturing. Uh, we need to up health uh, expertise. Um, and then hopefully we can generate the demand. Thank you. So Maxwell, that's an interesting question. And to Robin Beatrice's concern, um, we're, we're gonna, we, there's a way of killing two birds with one stone. So for safari doctors, healthcare has been an industry, but a reverse industry. Instead of sick people traveling to get the healthcare, it's professionals traveling to deliver the healthcare. So by the virtue of being in a place like Lamu, we're fortunate to get, um, you know, this week we have a group of gynecologists um, coming in. Next month, it's for the ophthalmology camp. We're just getting into a partnership with the university in the Netherlands. So it's bringing in that expertise so that the first mile can get the same top-notch healthcare while also addressing the issue of building ourselves um, locally, building Shungwaya Universal Healthcare, building that center of excellence of um, having that equipment that we need. So it's more of um, a different kind of industry because you have um, medical professionals around the world that have reached their apex of practice and now want to move in and take in that expertise where it's most needed, which now fills in our gaps in um, infrastructure wise in service in um, innovation so I think Kenya has the opportunity of making it an industry of not necessarily attracting the sick but attracting that expertise to build our capacity to then down the road now be able to cater um, uh, to those um, in most need around here so it's possible it's happening at a small scale and with with a twist in it Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, just, just to chime in, Maxwell, uh, just shortly. I, I think be, before that happens, uh, truly, we, we must make the, the service attractive. And I think this is the basic principle of selling in the market, right? You have to, if you're selling apples, you have to wipe them, make them shiny, so that uh, people can come to your store, right? But if, uh, from experience, if a PPP with the, you know, with the government on health uh, takes two years to do. So then how will we turn that uh, service into, into an industry if I have to wait for two years to be able to put my investment? So I think up until also internally, and I don't know whose role this is going to be, but up until we encourage and you know, make the systems uh, easy, make the systems uh, you know, uh, very approachable, then it also invites investments and that's how uh, industries grow and that's how they've grown over a period of time. Otherwise, uh, you know, today uh, you hear even possible investors who say, oh, you want to invest in public sector, forget about it. Um, you know, it will take you ages for you to be able to, uh, you know, to even start something. So I think that should be the first point where we should start from. That, that's that's actually a very valid and, and strong contribution there, Eric. Um, and, and I'm glad that Umra is uh, thinking about going into governance and elective politics. You know, there, there's there's a big problem. <laughs> the the amount of time it takes to get a project going, as Eric has said, on average, from what you're hearing from our members, is is four to six years, sometimes up to ten years before you can actually get. Uh, 
uh, a project going. And, and that is actually very, very discouraging to investors. In fact, by the second year, the third year, they've moved on. Um, they're looking at other opportunities as well. So it does then behove on all of us, uh, both from the private sector and the government to streamline these processes, streamline the policies that enable um, you know, that acceleration, that would enable that acceleration of uh, you know, entry into the market. And, and as Amcha, we're doing our bit to the extent that we can to ensure that we're able to support investors in, in these various uh, all manner of industries to really get into the market and help them also navigate um, the labyrinth that is government, especially when we want to, to, to engage in, in investment and some of these opportunities. So that's Max, it from- Max, so I was just gonna say, I think you're absolutely right because while if, you know companies who will invest in programs like this are setting, I mean, they're having to set now long-term goals for carbon reduction. So everyone's got a 2050 goal to be, you know, net zero, carbon net zero. But in terms of the of the other programs they're funding, they are much shorter term. You know, they're two, three, four, five years, and they're very much linked to the corporate strategy as well. And that changes over time as opportunities change. So you're absolutely right that, an, oh, you know, when boards change, it's very much sometimes. A, a, a focus of one CEO when when he or she moves on and another comes in, things can change and corporate strategies can change. So I think you're absolutely right. Making sure that um, that, 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 that that government can change quickly, can can adapt quickly enough to be able to respond to those opportunities, I think is absolutely the way to go. Great. So I'll hand over to Eva, who's going to close for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxwell, and thank you so much uh, to our speakers today, uh, Dr. Beatrice, Umra, and Eric. Your presentations have been most insightful and the conversation has been very um, thought provoking. And this is the purpose really of our round tables under the AmCham Post for Good initiative um, to amplify what our members are doing, um, gain thought leadership from, from leaders in the space, uh, such as yourselves, Dr. Beatrice and, and Umra. Um, and really champion collaboration and partnership uh, around sustainability and, and, and social impact uh, in Kenya, which is why I, I really appreciate your comments, Eric, on, on, the, on the core of partnership and collaboration. Uh, and that is how a private sector can really make their impact um, in, in community here in Kenya. So as part of the, the AmCham Force for Good, we have this series uh, of thematic roundtables. This is our second one. So we welcome you to join us for the third one, uh, which will be on the 29th um, of this month, which where, where we'll be dealing with uh, sustainable finance. And I think that touches on a lot of, a lot of sectors, including health. So I, I welcome you to, to join us for that session on the 29th. Um, we're also conducting a, a survey um, to, to benchmark where private sector is in prioritization of sustainability and social impact uh, in their business. And, and is it part of their core strategy as a, as a business or is it part of CSR? I mean, this, these are the conversations that we're having uh, today. So my colleague uh, Marcy will drop a, a link in the chat. Uh, we encourage you to take that survey. Uh, it will really help us uh, know what more we can do as private sector. Uh, it's completely anonymous. It will take you two minutes and we really, really appreciate your, your support. So with that, um, I'd like to ask all the speakers to turn on their videos so we can get a, a picture <laughs> of, of today's session. Um, and then after that, we'll close. So thank you very much. And thank you to the participants who joined us today. Maxwell, have you got the picture? <laughs> I have. Is Chris joining us? Chris, do you want to join us? Maybe it's, oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. I think we have it. Perfect. Thank you. I Thank heard you. the pic. Thank you. This is the end of the session. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you so Thank much. You. Lovely to meet Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.